Well, Daryl, I, I really appreciate your time. And if you don't mind, I, I want to try to get in uh, three or four more questions. Um, sure. But I want to switch gears just a little bit and maybe drill a little bit more into the idea of strategy and tactics for successful change. And I know that in your work and your articles and in your books, you, you talk about the idea of the importance of defining outcomes and developing a clear plan to achieve them. And you briefly alluded to that, I think, in your response to the first question. But how can this approach benefit organizations undergoing transformational change? So maybe ask a different way. What can you share in general about strategy and then tactics for successful change execution, right? Because strategy is one thing, but then the tactics to make that strategy successful are entirely a different thing. Oh, well, we've kind of in various ways, I guess we've touched on a lot of the tactics. Um, Once you're confident that you've developed a strategy that is sound, then it's all about orchestrating the, the human landscape to get it accepted. So first, let's be very, very clear among ourselves as the leaders, the authors of this strategy. L- let's be clear about what is our intent and make sure that we own it. I worked with a group a few months ago, Jack, that the problem was not down in the ranks. The ranks actually were more prepared to move forward with this, this strategy. You had key players at the executive team level that were either dragging their feet or in, in one case, overtly <laughs> saying, you know, this is this isn't the direction we should go. Well, you can't go down and enroll people if you haven't done that homework. So get very clear and concise about the, the intent. Make sure that the senior team is in a position of enrolling others and every level has to then enroll the following ones. And then take a look at Again, at the subculture level, at the subculture level, where are the inhibitors and how do we mitigate those? How do we close those gaps? So you end up, the tactics here is you end up with a roadmap. You've identified where you're going. You've gotten clear about the inhibitors and getting there. And you've got a roadmap by subculture of what needs to be done to end up at, at, at the mountaintop. You're starting in Chicago, I'm starting in in LA, but we're trying to get to the same intent. We should not be dealing with some cookie cutter that somehow homogenizes everything. You've got your own risk and I've got mine, and we've got to deal with those at a local level so that we all get together. So these are the tactics that come to play when we found what the leaders that were actually succeeding, they were engaged in activity like I was just describing. Those that were falling short, inevitably, they would first declare how important this change was, and then they would explain how they didn't have the time or sometimes the the people to do what I just described, and and yet they would proceed on anyway. So the strategy, without the capability to apply the tactics to reach full realization, you're going to end up with good ideas, but you're not going to end up with, with substantive movement. Yeah. Good stuff. You know, Daryl, um, this next question may may be putting you on a spot just a little bit, but if our listeners, you know, listening to this conversation today and, and truly some great insight, but how does Counter Partners approach change execution and how does it differ from other firms? You know, obviously you have had great experience and Counter Partners has been quite successful. What's your differentiator, would you say, in terms of effective change execution? Um, well, there's a... <laughs> I had, I had an advantage, Jack, for several years because when I started all this in 1974, there wasn't anybody else doing change work. So I, I sort of had it to myself for a while. <laughs> uh, now, there's a lot of individual practitioners and, and firms are in this work, and they are doing good work. So the field is much more mature than it was. And so, you know, I think we've got great tools and techniques, but I, I don't think that that's the differentiator. I think what pulls us out a little bit is... Number one, we, we only accept assignments that meet those three criteria. So I'm not involved in incremental change, only projects that are paradigm leaps, if you will, transformational in nature. Uh, nothing short of realization is going to be acceptable to the board. And by the way, it means we end up working with, with a lot of the boards. And we're going to measure this 
on realization metrics, but there's a lot at stake with these changes. And so there's no question that we have to reach realization. Well, if you build your practice just around that kind of urgency, it's different. I mean, I mean, think of me as I, I'm not a physician. I, I'm a, a heart specialist. I, and I only, <laughs> I only work with the patients with the more complex issues. So that, that kind of separates out the work. And then within that, although we end up helping the leaders at the top cascade down what needs to be taken down, the work itself that I'm involved in is with the CEO, the executive team around him or her, and the board. That three-tier upper echelon is where I focus. And, you know, a lot of folks would focus later. We're not a training company. There's a lot of education in our work. But we're not a training yeah. company. We're we're intervening with those the top level. And I think the last thing is just philosophically, it's very important to me to leave capability. Uh, I don't think an organization should be on an ongoing basis dependent on outside consulting for this. I think these are capabilities that they can acquire themselves. And so leaving leaders with how to do this on their own is just To me, that's important. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that. We've talked a lot about leadership and its relevance to culture and then culture's relevance to successful change. But how can organizations measure? And then, you know, you're obviously you're you're big into uh, metrics, but how can organizations measure their culture and track progress towards the desired outcomes? What what does that look like? Um, You actually can create dashboards uh, around progress once you define the culture that you want, and you've identified through your diagnosis what the inhibitors are at the local subculture level, then you can track, uh, and each of those subcultures created uh, mitigation strategies. So we can track, we've got realization and installation indicators of closing gaps. So you literally can measure progress by measuring to what degree are we moving toward these realization metrics that we set up. My preference is that's not just a dashboard for the ELT, but the board, you know, has a role in in asking how are we doing on that. So you can you can make it you know tangible. Now, but when I describe it that way, I, I I don't want to imply that human behavior can ever become you know so rigorous that it's it's paint by numbers. This is still. Yeah. You do. You deal with any kind of a cultural issue, and you're dealing with a very subjective set of circumstances. Yeah. But nonetheless, we can be objective about that subjectivity by creating metrics and dashboards. And uh, so, I, I don't want to suggest that it's all science. I think there's an awful lot of of art here. But one of my concerns is that a, a lot of the culture work to me is is softer than it needs to be. Yeah. So th- there absolutely are ways that you can help boards and executives really determine, are we making progress or not? 